But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. The tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen.
Let's keep it going now. Hey, come, man, on. Here you go. come on. Come on. What a happy day it is! Hey, hey, hey. Here's this up! Well, let's sing it together. Here we go! The greatest day in history. Death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Oh, we believe! Cross the empty grave. Life eternal. Life eternal. You have won the day. Shout it out. Jesus. Jesus is alive. Yes, he is. Alive. Yes, he is. And oh, happy day, happy day. You washed my sin away. Oh, happy day. He is risen. That's right. Come on, give him a shout. Amen. 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 Oh, welcome. Man, what a day to celebrate, huh? Parents, normally during this time, we do a greeting time. Uh, I want parents to find their kids. They're going to line up in the back. And so during this time, please find your kids. Welcome to Calvary to celebrate the fact that our Savior is risen. Amen. 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 At this time, I'd like you to go ahead and find a seat. 
My name is Pastor Josh Van Gorkum. I'm the family life and discipleship pastor. What an awesome day to celebrate that he is risen. And uh, we're very excited, as you can tell, to just proclaim loudly that our Savior is risen. Amen. One of the, yeah, oh, amen, amen. Let it happen. One of the things that we're going to do today that is uh, very meaningful to remember is what happened a few days ago on Good Friday. And uh, in order to do that, we are going to partake in communion this morning. And during our communion service, there's going to be a video on the screen set to a song. And I really want you to listen to the words of that song and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And remember the sacrifice that Jesus gave on that cross where he shed his blood that washed all our sins away. Now, our communion is open to anyone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. So if you've accepted him as your savior, please go ahead and partake this morning. If you haven't done that yet, you can speak to me or one of the people serving, but please let the elements pass you by. You may take the elements at any time that you feel led during this video. And then right out of the video and out of communion, we're gonna have another celebration with a baptism. And so if you would please turn your hearts and open your hearts to what the Holy Spirit is going to teach you in this time of communion. Ah! 
Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let my song join the one that never ends. Amen. Amen. I'm alive, I'm alive because he lives. Amen. Amen. about a powerful video and yet there she stands at the end of the video taking a picture of all of us kind of kind of rings a little truer to home um, I am absolutely elated uh, to be in here today um, it's always neat to see week after week now two weeks in a row where we've been able to keep this up on stage and uh, there's, there's something powerful about uh, seeing somebody be baptized. Um, and for me, one thing about my, my youth pastor, even, even more so, he gets to see me draw the line in the sand and say, no, I'm going to stand for Jesus. <laughs> there's, there's something powerful about that. And uh, today I get the great privilege to be able to baptize Jenna, so go ahead, come on out. Yeah, we got lucky. They, uh, they, they turned the water up for us. So um, I'm just going to ask Jenna a couple questions, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on. Uh, Jenna, by your own admission, have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? understand what being baptized means? Awesome. <laughs> is, is there anything else you'd like to say? Yes, uh, first I'd like to thank my parents and my family for supporting me and for nurturing me in my faith. And I would also like to thank Callan McKinley. A few years ago, I attended a young women's conference that she hosted, the Set Apart Conference, and that it just totally changed me and how I look at living my life for God. And it just encouraged me to, you know, be consecrated in him. I just lost what I was saying. <laughs> Thanks, Callan. Then by your own admission, I take the privilege to be baptized into my family, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him. Let's stand together. Continue our worship. Continue our celebration. In this moment, let's just tell him, we believe, we believe that you are risen, that you would save you. Receiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. We believe in God our Father, we believe in Christ. 
the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, we believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for we believe in the name of Jesus. church. Thank you, Jesus. Our judge and defender. Come on. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is in you. Oh, yeah, here it is. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. Oh, we, we believe in God. Father, let's believe we believe. We believe. Let's sing in one voice, one church, one heart. Come on. As we declare it in this place, Father, we believe. We believe in God. Come on. Thank you all. How could you, uh, how could you not explode with excitement when you saw 
all of those children with no inhibitions, no adult inhibitions, just expressing their love for God, that Jesus is alive. I want to thank you for uh, choosing today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ with us here at Calvary, whether live or live out there somewhere on our live stream, or whether it be in any of the delayed broadcasts that we do, including our television program that still runs on cable uh, public access the following Sunday. We thank you for, for joining us, and we thank you for uh, just the part that you have in making this a true celebration. And thank you for enduring today my weakness. Uh, it's been a miserable two weeks. Uh, the day before we left on our mission trip a week ago uh, for uh, Watertown, South Dakota, my throat got very sore and I spent the three days in Watertown very, very sick and kept working through it and still pounding nails and putting in electrical stuff and helping with as much as I could and, and uh, only had to take one nap one day but when I came home, it really affected me, and I have been laid up for the last uh, six or eight days uh, and still not recovered completely. But praise God, I'm experiencing resurrection power. Amen. <clears throat> and I want to thank all of our pastoral staff for the great job they do of just managing things and uh, continuing to help and uh, learn all the different roles there are around here as a church, and uh, thank you for all of our people who are filling in in our children's ministry department as we look for a director of our children's ministries here at Calvary, and just thank you for everybody who is participating in serving the Lord Jesus Christ here. In a moment, we're going to be turning to John chapter 20. You can put your finger there, but don't get distracted for a moment. It had been an amazing three years. John the Baptist had come on the scene and he had declared that something was about to happen in the nation of Israel. He had declared that the kingdom of God was near. And he had baptized people who were ready to turn away from the traditions of their old way of thinking, from the comfort zones of the religious establishment, and who were ready to get real about a relationship with God that was based on repentance and the forgiveness of sins, not on man's ability to earn the favor of God through his own works. Transformational message. A message that God said was so impactful on its culture that John needed to model what repentance really was by separating himself from his culture and living in the wilderness wearing nothing but animal skins and eating nothing but what he could find in the wilderness and not living in the traditional established way of creating a home. John, as the messenger of the coming kingdom, was told by God to flesh it out in his everyday life by living distinct and unique from everything that everybody else said was significant to a religious experience. 
there was something radical about to happen. Jesus came on the scene shortly after that, walking right up to John the Baptist. And John the Baptist instantly recognizing him as the Messiah, the one of whom he had been preaching and teaching and proclaiming. And Jesus said, I want to affirm your message of repentance and separation from all of the old ways that I am here to declare that is the fundamental principle of the kingdom of God and I want you to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. And John did. Baptism is not for accomplishing salvation. Never has been. Your baptism, whether it was as a child or an adult, did not, cannot save you from sin and its consequences. It never can, never will. <laughs> baptism is a testimony of a conscience that has already been made clear and holy by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ in the heart. For by grace through faith are we saved. It is not of ourselves. It is not an act of ourselves. It is not a work of man. It is the gift of God so that none of us can boast. Jesus did not need to be baptized to be forgiven for his sin. Jesus was baptized to declare that he was confirming the message of repentance and that it was his beginning of a public life for the glory of the Father. And Jenna made that statement this morning. The beginning of a public life to the glory of the Father. I've had two young people come up to me this morning already before the service that I will be meeting with one of them I know for sure tomorrow the other one I'm not sure yet two young people that have asked to be baptized pray for them pray for them they're young children they're young children but if they understand what I just said about what baptism is, praise God. Let their public life to the glory of God begin as soon as possible. So Jesus begins this public ministry. He pours himself into the people for three years, calling out disciples to follow him, calling out 12 specifically to be the inner circle of those disciples teaching them all the things that they would need to know about the kingdom and declaring to them that the Son of Man, in order to initiate this kingdom, would have to die. But that death would not be his end and that he would rise again. The disciples were a lot like us. We just don't listen. We just don't listen. We listen only through the filters of our preconceived ideas. We listen only through the filters of our desires for what we wish God would say to us. The disciples did the same thing. For right up to the very end, they were still thinking that Jesus meant that the kingdom would be established overthrowing the Roman Empire and that it would begin in their lifetime. They didn't hear Jesus say, but I will have to die, but I will not stay dead, and after three days, I will have life again. They did not hear that. And I wonder how many are here today and have not heard what God has been saying. You have heard many times the truths of Jesus Christ and his salvation. 
you have heard many times that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world and rose again to guarantee eternal life. But you have not heard that Jesus said, and if you will die as I died to everything of the flesh so that my spirit can be born in you through that death and my life can be resurrected in you. You have ignored that. You have allowed all of the things that you have been taught to filter around in your head. But for some reason, most likely because of fear, fear of the loss of cultural relevance, fear of the loss of social status, fear of the loss of relationships, fear of the loss of fill in the blank. You've chosen not to hear what Jesus said. Repent. Separate yourself completely from anything and everything that was culturally or spiritually or emotionally or relationally relevant to your life. Separate yourself from it and put it to death so that my life can be resurrected inside of you and you will now live for the glory of the one who died for you and no longer live for yourself. Have you heard that message? Have you obeyed that message? Are you living that message? The disciples were not living that message. And on the morning of the resurrection, the morning of the day when sometime during the night Jesus was raised from the dead. We have in the, night, in the 20th chapter of John a great story of that resurrection. Great depiction of this historical truth. Now if you doubt the evidence for the resurrection, I believe we still have some of the pamphlets, do we Josh, out at the Connect Center? Uh, out at the Connect Center, there is a brochure, a pamphlet available that talks about all of the, the evidences for the resurrection so that you can see the historical accuracy of the scriptures when it comes to the actual resurrection fact that Jesus is alive. For all eternity, he's alive. But on the morning of that resurrection... We read the following thing in John chapter 20. And we're not going to read all of these verses yet. We are going to eventually read all of them as we go through this carefully this morning as we see a progression of what was happening. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Let's start there. In the place where most of us are, for far too much of our lives, in a place of fear. In a place of fear. I don't know what you're afraid of. I know what I'm afraid of. I, I was a, really afraid that I wasn't going to be able to be up here preaching today. But I trusted God's strength and God's power, and I praise him for the opportunity to share what he has put on my heart from this passage because we are all on a journey, and it starts in a place of fear. Some of us are afraid that we won't get recognized. Some of us are afraid that we won't get commended. Some of us are afraid that we won't be rewarded for what we do because with recognition has to come reward. 
we want the promotion, we want the pay raise, we, whatever it is. Some of us are afraid that we won't be liked. Some of us are afraid we won't fit in. And so we try as much as we can, primarily by looking at other people that we declare likable, who have accomplished what is necessary to fit in. And then we just simply work hard to imitate them. Because if it worked for them, it'll work for us. We live in fear. We live in fear of what the consequences of a particular health issue are going to be. We live in fear that deep in my heart, I may not, I may not know the truth. We live in fear that things won't turn out the way we think they should. We live in fear. Mary was the representative of the fear that existed in the circle of the disciples and the followers of Jesus, who after the resurrection, of course, during the, or during the crucifixion, rather, had run away except for one, John, and a couple of the Marys. They had run away, hidden themselves for fear that this kind of a public state, I don't want to be associated with something that failed. Their fear was based on the declaration that the crucifixion was the judgment of God on Jesus Christ for having failed at his mission. And they were hiding. It tells us they had locked themselves in rooms for fear that the soldiers would come and arrest them too. And when Mary goes to the tomb that morning to finish the job of putting the spices around the body to make it a, a proper Jewish burial, she found the tomb open. The stone, this massive stone, rolled away from the opening. And she stooped down and looked in and she saw nothing, not a human body. And she ran in fear back to Peter and John, locked in their room, and said, we don't know where he is, they've taken him. What are we going to do now? Many of you are at that place in your life today. What are we going to do now? What am I going to do? Well, read on. Verse 3, so Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. God wants to move you from your fear to faith. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God wants you to be moved from fear to faith. Peter was obviously not the athlete that John was. John outran him, got to the tomb first. John was not as courageous as Peter. 
we know that from other times in Peter's life in the ministry with Jesus, when Peter was always at the front claiming to be able to do more than what he was capable of accomplishing. And so John got there first, saw what Mary had said, looked inside as Mary did, but did not go in. Ladies and gentlemen, your faith will not begin to conquer your fears, whatever they are in your life, whatever you are afraid of in this massive and eternal relationship with Jesus Christ, whatever it is that is keeping you from making that commitment to the Savior who died for your sins and rose from the dead to guarantee you eternal life, and whatever fear is making you hang on to what you call life right now will not be replaced by faith until you go into the tomb, until you choose to die as Jesus died to anything and everything that you call significant in this life, then and only then can God bring faith to you so that you can see the risen Lord. You need to go into the tomb. Their fear turned to faith. But it was not, it was not a saving faith yet. Because verse 9 says, For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. So in other words, the disciples simply believed he's gone. They believed what Mary's report was. They believed he had been taken from the tomb. Do not misinterpret they went into the tomb, saw the body was gone, and they believed what Mary said, but they did not yet believe what God had said, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Your faith planted as a seed in your life by God himself to bring forth the fruit of redemption will not bear that fruit until it is born according to the scriptures, not according to man's view, not according to man's story. Man's story was, body's gone. Somebody took him. We don't know where he is. The belief in that story had no power for their life. No power. But what is about to happen has power. Now, let's just review from fear to faith again in the life of Mary, as we read on in verse 11. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Look, if John and Peter understood that Jesus was to have risen from the dead and Mary was standing there outside the tomb when they came out and they said, we believe, we believe, we believe. Here's what happened, Mary. Mary would not have been left in that state. She had no idea yet that Jesus has risen from the dead, nor did John and Peter. They simply believed Mary's story. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? You see the fear? Mary in the same place of fear, all of these years invested in 
this following of this Jesus, and look at what it's done. It's not only killed him, but now they've taken his body. We don't know where he is. Is there anything relevant at all left to what we have invested? We're afraid. And she said, sir, if, you have, if you're the one that carried him away, tell me where you laid him so that I can go get him and I can take him back. And Jesus said to her, Mary. I don't know what it was in that moment that caused her to recognize him. Was it the Holy Spirit that opened her eyes so that she could see who he really was? Was it the fact that he said her name in a way that only Jesus had ever said her name to her? Because you must understand that Jesus will say your name to you in a way that no one else has ever said it. He will say it with such love and such grace, with such an eternal embrace that you will know it is him because no human could possibly say my name with that much love. Or was it just simply the fact that she had not introduced himself to this stranger and yet he knew her name? And there's only one person I know that knows what nobody else knows about who I am. And you see, Jesus knows what nobody else knows about who you are. And yet he calls your name. He calls for you. And at that moment, she recognized him and says, Teacher. She moved from fear to real faith because she identified the resurrected Lord. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. She moved from fear to faith to rejoicing to peace. I'm sorry. Sorry. My fault, Molly. Forgot my own outline. She moved to peace. I want you to see this. I want you to see in Mary for a moment as she stands there Put yourself in her place at the tomb. Peter and John have gone in, and they have been absolutely no help to her at all. She said, they've taken him, and I don't know where they have put him. They ran to the tomb, went inside, believed her story, and then turned and went home and did nothing about it. Some of you are sitting here today claiming to have faith in God, but you're doing nothing about it. It has not changed you. It has not made you see life differently. It has not made you respond to people differently or to circumstances differently. And Mary is standing there going, Hey guys, uh, you sure you want to go home? Don't we want to look for Jesus? Don't we want to find out what happened? Where are the guards that were posted? What we, sh we better go find something out. Peter and John didn't even do that. They simply went home in fear. 
Mary stands there, and God meets her at the point of her fears with an angel, two angels, that tell her or ask her a question. Now, one of the other Gospels tells us that the angels also said, He's not here. He is risen. Why do you seek the living among the dead? And then Jesus shows up. She turns around, still flustered, still very anxious, still very annoyed, still very frustrated, still very fearful of what really is taking place. And she says to this man that she presumes to be the gardener. We don't read this necessarily in the text. I read it in my own heart as to how I would do it. With a finger pointed in his face. Were you the one that took him? Do you know where he is? Quick, I need to know the answer to this. I've got to get this resolved right now. I need to know. Fix this. Hurry up. And with one word, her name, all the fear and frustration is gone. And she simply says, teacher. Everything is gone. And she is at peace. The resurrected Lord has that effect on us. If you've never known it, maybe you've never really known him. Because the peace that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and your minds in the resurrected Lord Christ Jesus forever and ever. So that this afternoon or tomorrow morning when the phone rings or the boss calls you into his office or the, the police turn on their lights behind you or whatever happens, there is no fear. For in Christ we have peace with God at all times. The resurrected Christ has that effect on us. And it did for Mary as well. The disciples are going to get it next. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Okay, look. The disciples have already been to the tomb. They've already uh, seen that the body of Jesus was gone. They go home and they lock the doors for fear that this has made matters worse. <laughs> that this may have made matters worse. Already the Jews are after us. They've questioned us as to whether we knew Jesus or not. And some of us even denied that we did. So that if a band of rebels came into our school where we are teaching or a student and held a gun to our head and said, are you a Muslim or a Christian? What would you say? Really? Are you ready today to be blown away? Because you have been blown away by the resurrection of Jesus Christ? These disciples were in fear for their lives. And this is even after Mary said, I've seen the Lord. <laughs> Get that. How many times will you sit in a church 
or watch a broadcast on the internet or on TV and be told that the risen Savior wants to resurrect his life in yours, in place of yours, and give you eternity as your present reality, and you choose to lock the door for fear of what that might mean in your everyday life. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. All the fear can be gone. All the worries, all the concerns. Even though the problems will continue because we live in a depraved world that is living under the consequences of sin and the problems and the issues and the hardships and the trials and the persecutions and all of the disabilities of life will continue you can be at peace. You can have the peace of God by meeting the resurrected Savior. And when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They were glad when they saw the Lord. They moved from peace to rejoicing. They were glad. Oh, wasn't it fun to rejoice in the resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning? Wasn't it fun to do that here in this place of safety and security when everybody will understand what you're doing? Good practice for tomorrow when not many will understand what you're doing. And you celebrate in your life the risen Savior every day. And you are the Lord that they get to see so they can come to faith. You are the evidence of the risen Savior. Your life, my life, is the evidence that Jesus is alive. Excuse me for a second. But Jesus wasn't done with them yet. He said to them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so, I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Let me explain to you what this is. They went from fear to faith to peace to rejoicing to reconciliation. They moved to a reconciled relationship with Almighty God that from God's perspective at that instant, three minutes ago, think about this, three minutes earlier, they were living in fear behind locked doors. Three minutes or less, they were living in fear. We'll give them three minutes to be glad and rejoice and hug Jesus and look at the scars. And then Jesus says this. Now that you understand that I am alive, I trust you to go and represent me. They didn't have to earn it. Jesus didn't have to ask them to go do anything to say, okay, now I need to test you guys to make sure you really get this. Jesus instantly reconciled their relationship and imparted to them his full trust by giving them the manifestation of the Holy Spirit to represent God's 
will. Now, don't get hung up on that verse that says, whoever you forgive will be forgiven in heaven, and whoever you won't forgive won't be forgiven in heaven. Don't get hung up in the flesh's interpretation of that, which would say, oh, so I have the authority to forgive and not forgive, and I have the authority to choose who gets my forgiveness and who doesn't get my forgiveness. No, you have the authority of the Holy Spirit in a reconciled relationship with God to represent God's will for that person, not yours. And if in the power of the Holy Spirit he has told you to forgive them, then you will forgive them. And if he has told you, wait, they're not at a point of repentance yet, so do not reconcile the relationship until there is repentance, then represent that to them as well. But you are representing my purpose for them, not your own. You see, God calls us in relationship with Jesus Christ to be the representative of the Father's will. That's what a reconciled relationship looks like. Well, I want to show you quickly in closing, and I also want to thank our worship team and Pastor Josh and Pastor James Allen and Pastor Drew for being so organized this morning that they allowed me all this time because um, I need to bring this back a little bit more to home and show you the impact that this message from that story of the resurrection to show you the impact that the resurrected Christ had on the Apostle Paul and what he told us. So let me quickly turn to Romans chapter 4, verse, starting in verse 24 through chapter 5, verse 11. And let me quick, you, quickly review all of those points in fact, you can just go ahead and throw them all up there right now, Molly, and, uh, and then we'll look for them all in this passage and see that the Apostle Paul says, this message is for all of you too and me. This is what God is calling you to today. Paul is talking here about Abraham and his faith that he had in God that Sarah, even at her old age, would be able to bear a son to fulfill the covenant of God. And that his faith in what God could do and would do was counted to him as righteousness. Paul then says this, that same kind of faith will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. I want you to see the fear in that, first of all. Jesus Christ had to be delivered up to pay for our sin. I don't know if you've ever done this before or not, but have you taken even the smallest sin as declared according to the human standards of categorizing sin because God doesn't? Have you taken even the smallest of your sins and taken it into the holy presence of God and said, I don't really need to be afraid of this, do I? I don't really need to be afraid of this, do I? Or have you ever been to the point where you are so overwhelmed with the fear of God's judgment over any and all sin that you literally wondered what you would do. And so you lock the doors and you hide hoping you won't be found out. Faith has to begin at that place of fear. The fear of God who holds the power of eternity over your life. But he was not only delivered up for our trespasses, he was raised for our justification. And then he says, therefore, since we have been justified by 
faith, in other words, faith in the price Jesus paid on the cross for our sin, faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, acknowledgement of God's, God's commendation of that payment, that it satisfies his wrath against sin, and when we put our faith in that satisfactory payment for sin, Jesus' death, we are justified by God. Meaning, God looks down and goes, I declare you to be not guilty anymore. I have been declared by the resurrected Lord to be not guilty anymore. I have been declared, you have been declared by the resurrected Lord through faith in what Jesus did to be not guilty anymore. Now, cover your toes because they might get hurt right now. If that doesn't cause you to explode with rejoicing, it's because you've never been in the place of fear of your sin. You've never been really afraid of the guilt of your sin before God. You think you have a way to get out from underneath God's punishment and God's wrath on your own. God's really not going to punish me with eternal condemnation for my sin. And after all, my sins aren't as bad as their sins. I can certainly justify what I've done. And if you didn't feel at that moment of realizing that by faith you have been declared not guilty, you have never really dealt with the fear of a holy God who stands with eternity over your life and the right to declare you guilty or not guilty. Move from fear to faith. And because we have been justified by pay faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. And through him, we have also attained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And because it's the peace of God based on my justification and not on God making everything right in my life and fixing all of my problems and all of my circumstances, because it's by faith in his justification of my life, I can rejoice even when I suffer. For we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And then he goes on and he says this, verse 11, more than that, let me read verse 10 also, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see how the impact of the resurrected Christ affected the Apostle Paul, and what he tells each one of us, that if you will, in the fear of eternal condemnation for the sins of which we are all guilty, standing before a holy and a perfect God, come to faith in the resurrected Lord and meet him face to face and find his peace that passes all understanding. We will be able to rejoice even in the midst of suffering because we have been eternally reconciled to God 
and we are his forever. Would you pray with me as the worship team comes? This is a very serious time right now. Very serious time. Please don't pay attention to the worship team members as they come up on stage. Look deep into your heart right now. Because you may be here today because this is your yearly opportunity to go to church because it's Easter. You may be here today because your family is all together for the holiday and you just had to come to church with them. I don't know what it is. All I know is that the Holy Spirit right now is pounding on your heart's door and saying, all those fears you have, all of those past failures, all of the things that you hope nobody ever finds out about your life, all of those things that you wish you could be done with the consequences of all of them, they don't matter in this instance. What matters is Jesus is calling your name right now. And if I had the ability to, I would spend the next five minutes calling out every one of your names. But the Holy Spirit is doing it in your heart right now. And he's saying, will you believe in the resurrection? Will you believe in Jesus Christ who died for your sin and rose from the dead to guarantee you eternal life and will you give your life to him by dying to everything you thought was significant and letting the life of Christ be resurrected in you Today is your day to do that. So before we sing, because we're going to sing a reprise of a song we did right before the message, I Believe. And we can't sing that until we know that everybody's been given an opportunity to sing it as the truth of their own heart. So right now, on this day of Easter, celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Can we please celebrate the resurrection of Christ in your heart, in your life, by having you courageously, courageously stand up right where you're at right now and just stand there and say, Pastor, would you send an elder to my side or would someone who's sitting near you who knows Jesus come right to your side and bow their head with you and pray as you repent of your sin to Jesus and invite him to be your Savior. Is there anyone who courageously today will stand where you are and meet the risen Lord? And if you're not able to stand, raise your hand and say today, I want to meet Jesus. I want him to save me. Thank you. Would someone, Kara or, where's Kara or Chris? Kara, will you please pray with her right now? Where's another one? There's one right over there. Okay, who, is that Randy? Or there, there's Kayleen. Okay, Kayleen. Thank you. Thank you. Would, if you want to go to a private room, please go out and go to a private room and do that and pray with them. Is there anyone else who today says, this is my day. I came for a reason. It was my day to meet Jesus and to give up on everything that I'd always tried to make sense of my life. And today I'm ready to surrender to Jesus and ask for his forgiveness. Is there anyone else? There's another one. Right back there, thank you. Is there another lady? Uh, Peggy, there's a lady right behind you back there standing. Would you? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Is there anyone else? 
Anyone else? And you say, today, today I want to meet Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Be courageous. Jesus got up naked on a cross and hung there in front of the world, bleeding to death for you. Would you just stand up right now and meet him? And invite him to be your Lord and your Savior. And ask for his forgiveness. And he will embrace you and reconcile your relationship to God. Anyone else? For the rest of us, would you stand and sing? We believe. We believe. We believe in God our Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. We believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. Oh, we believe in the name of Jesus. We believe in God our Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three. the ushers are going to go ahead and take your offering and so once you have that plate is passed you by you're free to celebrate as we sing and you're free to leave thank you and happy easter he is risen he is risen he's risen